morning. My name is Brad Olson. I'm the head Jesus follower here and welcome to worship at Loveland United Methodist Church. Thank you to Joan. Um, a song that I believe was um, picked as a tribute to 9-11 on the 21st anniversary. Is it on? It's on on my end. Testing, testing. One, two, three. Testing, testing. I can hear it in the... Maybe I can't. No, yes, no, yes. Okay. 
Try it again. Plan B. It's always nice to have a plan B. How's that sound? Testing, testing. I think it's still dead. Just speak up. One, two, three. All right, we'll, uh, I'll speak up. A song I think that Joan chose as a tribute to 9-11. However, did you recognize the tune also? All right, one, two, three. I know you recognize it as God Bless America. However, do you know that that also is a tune that's really important in England right now? We Americans like to think we stole it from them. Um, also a good tribute to uh, Queen Elizabeth II, God Save the Queen. Um, today we're going to be continuing a call to prayer. We're looking at the word pray as an acronym where P reminds us to praise, R reminds us to repent. And so we're going to focus on the um, apologizing or repenting, which reminds me of a story of something that happened to be on a mission trip down to Nicaragua. One of the projects that our team was working on was painting the inside of a church. Now, we weren't sure, though, that we had enough paint to go and cover the entire service. service. So you know what we did? We added some water to the paint. I think Doug knows what's coming here. The problem is that when we added water to it, it thinned it out, and it didn't cover the in, um, as much as it should have. And so we asked the pastor of the church, Shut, what should we do? And his answer was, repaint and thin no more. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to turn things over to Lisa. Lisa's going to draw your attention to the happenings page and some of the things going on in the life of our church and then get us started in worship. <laughs> Actually, he's not. <laughs> Maybe longer. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> if you open your um, bulletin this morning, I want to draw your attention to quite a few things in there. Um, first and foremost, the connection card. Please um, fill it in. Let us know you're here today. Um, also, if you don't feel like writing this morning, you can use the QR code. That's just as easy and just as effective for us to know that you've been here. The first thing is, we, in addition to Brad's um, sermon series on prayer, we are starting an all-church study on prayer. It's called the Prayer Course, and in your bulletin, it gives you the link. It's a Right Now Media video every week, and it's for eight weeks. And then in your bulletin, you're going to get each week the study guide that goes along with that video. And we launched Friday night at Sharon and Rob White's house, and it was really good. And when I first picked this out, I thought, maybe it's too simple, but it's not. It's just very touching, it's very deep. You can do it with a small group, you can do it alone with a cup of coffee at your house. Bottom line, if you have any questions hooking up to the Right Now Media, um, you can look at our webpage. There is a link to it on the LUMC webpage at the bottom. It says free gift. So if you don't already have a Right Now Media account, check that out. If you get stuck, email me and I will help you through it. So I hope everybody participates. It's going to be a really good eight week immersion in what it means to pray. All right. Secondly, there is a fall concert coming up swiftly here now on the 17th. We'd love for you to invite, invite, invite people. This is going to be a really nice evening to be with our church family and hopefully get some other people in here. Um, there'll be light refreshments. It'll just be a real nice evening for everybody. Then thirdly, the festival of sharing is still going on. The bags are still in the back. In the, well, towards the front of the gathering area. It's not too late to go out. There's a grocery list. I did mine yesterday, super easy. Bring it back and it'll be ready to go. Um, also, in um, regards to the food pantry, there's an empty bowls um, dinner evening. What is it? Lunch fundraiser, yeah. Fun to do with a small group, fun to do with um, your family. And the information for that was in our bulletin last week, but there's also flyers out by where you pick up the bags for the um, Festival of Sharing. 
And then on Sunday, August 2nd at 9 a.m., we will have one worship service that day, followed at 1030 by a state of the church meeting that we would love for everybody to be there for, um, to learn about the challenges and also the opportunities here at LUMC. It's, it's important that we all be there for our church. Now, the call to worship is from Psalm 148. It's interactive. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. And he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. And if you'll please stand, we will all sing together.
please be seated. I'd like to invite you to join together with me in affirming our faith. This affirmation comes from the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. Will you join with me? We believe the poor in spirit are blessed, and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn are blessed, and they will be comforted. The meek are blessed, and they will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, and they will receive mercy. The pure in heart are blessed, and they will see God. The peacemakers are blessed, and they will be called children of God. Those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake are blessed, and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We believe we are blessed when people revile and per us and persecute us and falsely utter all kinds of evil against us because of Jesus Christ. We shall rejoice and be glad, for our reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before us. Amen.
spectacular the last couple nights, by the way. Don, shooting star, right? Was that Friday night? And thank you, Rob White, for accompanying on the French horn. We are a people of prayer, and so I'd like to invite you to join together with me in our congregational prayer. This one comes from um, Dmitri of Russia in the 17th century. Let us pray. Come, my light, and illumine my darkness. Come, my life, and revive me from death. Come, my physician, and heal my wounds. Come, flame of divine love, and burn up the thorns of my sin, kindling my heart with the flame of thy love. Come, my king, sit upon the throne of my heart and reign there, for thou alone art my king and my lord. Amen. Um, hi, my name is Todd Kuramoto, and our first scripture, scripture reading is from 2 Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 12 through 18. Lo, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to, d to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will hear, heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I have covenanted with David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. This is the word of the Lord. In this moment, I have two helpers with me, Rachel and Courtney. I'm going to ask you guys to go and stand about three quarters of the way back and face me. You ever played red light, green light? OK. We're going to play a little game of red light, green light, but this has a little twist on it. Usually the person calling out red light, green light stands with their backs to the people so they don't know how quickly folks are approaching, and then they get snuck up on, and then they trade places. Well, I'm going to watch you so I can totally control the red light, green light, and we're going to add U-turn. So if I say U-turn, you have to turn around and go the other way. All right? Directly back. Okay. Ready? Okay. Green light. Red light. Green light. Red light. U-turn. Green light, red light, U-turn, green light, red light, oh, so close, U-turn, green light, red light, green light, turn around, U-turn, wrong words, U-turn, green light, and I let them make it, very good, thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much for the illustration, that's right, they deserve a round of applause. They do, because I asked them like four minutes ago if they would do this. I thought about red light, green light with our Sunday school lesson about Saul becoming Paul after his conversion on the Damascus Road when Jesus literally blinded him with a bright light and called to him and said, why are you persecuting my people? You need to stop doing this. The red light, green light kind of is the He's traveling on this road. He's got an agenda. He's got a letter from the king. He's going to go arrest these Christians and throw them in jail. And God stops him. He thinks he has a green light, and God puts a great big red light right in his way. Not only did he put a, green re a big uh, red light, but he in instituted a U-turn. Because right along with Pastor Brad's sermon series, when we're looking at the letter R in pray and saying it's for repent, 
The word repent means to turn. If you repent, you turn. You turn from what you're doing. It's like saying it's a 180. So Saul had a red light, green light experience on the Damascus Road. God stopped him in his tracks, literally blinded him. He heard the voice of Jesus. The green light was given when God sent Ananias to heal him, and Paul made a U-turn and repented and became Paul instead of Saul, and from that point on served God with a faithfulness and a fervor not seen by many. So whenever you see your red light, green light as you're driving down the street, Think about the green light that God always gives us and always the opportunity for the U-turn to repent. See you next time. And you can stand and greet your neighbor and pass the peace. Good morning. My name is Mary, and our second scripture reading is from Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her neighbors and friends together and says, Rejoice with me. 
I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. All to prayer. And I'm challenging all of us each day to pray, Come, Holy Spirit, fill my heart with more than of you. Do you feel like uh, your prayer time needs a little bit of a fresh perspective? When you go to the Lord in prayer, have you been doing the same thing for so long? Maybe you've forgotten why you do it. Is it time maybe to try something a little bit different? A month or so ago, I found this guideline for prayer that I'm finding really helpful, and so I've been using this as an opportunity to also share it with you. And here it is. Are you ready for this? It is pray. I like that because it's pretty simple, and it's what we're doing, and so it seems to fit well with the context. And the idea is that pray is not only what we're doing, but it's also an acronym that can be used as a guide for how we spend our time in prayer, where the P reminds us to spend some time praising God for who he is and what he's done in our life. The R reminds us to repent. The A reminds us to ask, let our requests be known to God, and the why reminds us to yield. Today I thought we'd focus on the R, or the repent piece. Prayer is something that changes us, right? Because it's something that we're spending time in the presence of the Lord, and we can be completely and fully honest. The Lord knows us better than we know ourselves, and so there's no sense in hiding something from God. And so it's a time to be completely honest with ourselves, and because... You can't fix what you don't face. And so it's a beginning towards healing. Now, I know that the word repent is something that we don't use a whole lot these days. And so language that might be more familiar to us is the language of apology. It's basically to say, I am sorry. All right, will you say that with me? I am sorry. There is a, uh, last week I propose to you the idea that the scriptures can be read in a number of different ways, that usually when we read the scriptures, we read them for information, but they also can be used as our prayers to God. I turn to the uh, 150th Psalm as an example of words that might be used to praise God. The place that we can turn for words of repentance are to the 139th Psalm. The 139th Psalm says there, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You'd be fulfilling what James 5.16 says, where it says there, confess your sins to one another and you will be saved and you will be healed. As I've been looking for examples of repentance, one of them that I ran across was maybe the greatest preacher America has ever seen, a guy by the name of George Whitfield. George Whitfield was, as I said, probably the greatest preacher that America has ever seen, really was in large part responsible for leading us into the Great Awakening. And here's something I learned about him that I hadn't known before. In 1743, he and his wife Elizabeth welcomed their first child into the world. It was a son. He was so convinced that his son was going to be an even greater preacher, evangelist, prophet than he was. And so when it came to name time, the time to name their son, they named him John after John the Baptist. And it was no mistake that he drew the parallel between their son being named John and John's mother was, do you remember, Elizabeth? And their son's name was Elizabeth. And so he saw this as a parallel. It was just a prophetic divine sign that this child was going to be a great evangelistic prophet preacher. At John's baptism, he preached a fiery sermon on all the great things that God was going to do through this child. Sadly, though, at four months old, their son John died. Now, they were grief-stricken partly because they'd lost their child, but also because 
he had to face the, the very hard reality that maybe what he was doing was not listening to God's intentions for his son's life, but rather what he was doing was more acting out of parental pride. And so even he had to repent and had to change. Our first scripture we reading was uh, on King David. King David, you know, was the greatest king that Israel had ever known. And one of the things I like about the Old Testament is it remembers that there were some things that he didn't get right away too. For example, God came to him and he got this idea to build a temple. God said, I will build you a temple. And so he started doing the work to build a temple. But then God had to come to him and say, wait a minute here now. I'm not going to build you're not going to be the one that's going to build this temple. That's going to have to be left to your son Solomon. What I intended to say was not you were going to build a temple, but I was going to build you into a temple. Do you see the slight change there? Sin tends to work that way, doesn't it? We tend to, it tends to try to convince us that God's way is our way instead of letting us see how God's way should be our way. And so if we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, what hope is there for us? Well, partly to be honest with God. To remember that God is like, well, a shepherd that has a sheep that's wandered off. And what does the shepherd do? Drops everything that he's doing and goes in search of that sheep that has wandered off. Or like a woman who's lost a coin. And what does the woman do? She drops everything searches everywhere in the house until she can find that coin that is lost. And what does God do when the coin is found or when the sheep is brought back in? There is more rejoicing in heaven, we are told, over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. I like the story about the Sunday school class. The Sunday school teacher asked the question, If all the good children in the world are green and all of the bad children in the world are red, what color are you? It's a good question to ponder, isn't it? If all the good people somehow magically could be painted green and all the bad children or all the bad people could suddenly be painted red, what color would you be? One child dared to raise their hand, and I love their answer. Their answer was, I'd be striped. I've got both good and bad in me. That's what going to the Lord with a repentant spirit says, is, Lord, I've got good in me, but I've also got some some areas where I need to grow, some areas that I need to work on and to confess those to the Lord. And often it comes with the language of saying, I'm sorry. Because repentance isn't a word we use a whole lot anymore. Do you remember a book that was written uh, probably 15 years ago by a ni- guy named Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages? Have you read this? If you haven't, it's a good read. It basically argues that we all have different ways of saying I love you, and sometimes people are saying they love us, and we don't see it because they're speaking in another language or in, in their own way, and so it's good to know what people's love languages are. Did you know they came out with a sequel to that? Gary Chapman teamed up with a person by the name of Jennifer Thomas, and the sequel to The Five Love Languages, have you read this one? Is The Five Languages of Apology. They suggest also that there are different dynamics that go into saying the words, I'm sorry. All right, so let's give it a try. Are you ready for these? Basically, it's to say, I'm sorry. So will you repeat after me? I am sorry. So what are these five different dynamics of apology? Well, they are first to express regret. Secondly, to accept responsibility. I'm really sorry. Thirdly, to, um, to m- try to make restitution or say, is there some way that I can make it right? Fourth, to see a change in behavior. And lastly, to ask for forgiveness. All right, so I thought I'd take a little bit of time, uh, just a couple of minutes on each of these and dig a little bit more deeply into them. First, to express regret. To say, I am sorry. In Acts chapter 8, there's a story about a magician by the name of Simon. 
Peter and John come to town, and the group of people that he was with knew the stories of Jesus. They'd accept Jesus into their lives, but they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit. And so Peter and John pray that they will receive the Holy Spirit, and they do. And because they receive the Holy Spirit, they're able to do things that they weren't able to do, magical and wondrous things. But Simon wasn't there, so Simon didn't receive the Holy Spirit, and Simon thought if he had the Holy Spirit, it would be good for business. He's a magician. So he goes to Peter and he says to him, how much would it cost me to buy the Holy Spirit? Peter says, ah, that's not the way this works. In fact, if you're going to have any chance of getting, receiving the Holy Spirit, you, you need to ask for forgiveness for even thinking that that's the way. And what Peter says is, here's what you need to do. You need to repent Repent the intentions of your heart and ask for forgiveness that you might be healed. The intentions of his heart. Apparently not only actions but also intentions are we, what we can take to the Lord. And they make the point, for goodness sakes, don't use the word but when you're apologizing. Have you ever had anybody do that? I'm sorry, but. It has the effect, really, of ne negating the entire apology and really puts the blame back on the person you're blaming, you're talking to for whatever it is that you're apologizing for. They use the example of a teenage girl who went out and was supposed to be home by curfew but got home two and a half hours late. Dad, of course, was there waiting for her and was not at all happy and had some choice words to say to her. And her way of apologizing was, Dad, I'm really sorry, but your rules are really silly and I didn't, shouldn't have to follow them anyway. I'm sorry, don't use the word but. There is a book that I pick up every now and then that I like mostly for the title by a guy by the name of, um, um, oh, what is his name? The title of the book is, Yes, Lord, I have sinned, but I have several excellent excuses. When you apologize, when you spend your time with the Lord in prayer, be honest, be honest. It doesn't help to say the words if you don't mean them. They ought to have both the words and the, the expression that goes behind them. In short, they are a matter of saying, expressing sorrow and saying, I am sorry. Will you say that with me? I am sorry. They are also a matter of accepting responsibility of accepting responsibility. And a person who is, does a good job of that, I think, is um, the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed in me and the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. Or in other words, he took responsibility for the things that he had been doing wrong. Every now and then, you see other people that will do that. And I ran across a story of a CEO that did that. This is unusual. I thought that was unusual. Um, have you ever heard of the car, the Chevy Cobalt? Do you remember when Chevy made a car called the Cobalt? Probably not a lot of you do because it wasn't around for a very long time. They seem to have this problem in that when people would stick the key in the, this was when cars had keys, keys in the ignition and turned it on, the ignition tended to catch on fire. And so several dozen people died in fires that had been started, and so they recalled the cars. And I remember um, General Motors, the CEO, was a person by the name of Mary Barra who did a press conference. And I thought it was striking the way that she started this press conference. She said, General Motors wants to do the right thing. We sincerely apologize for anyone that was hurt by one of our cars that's being recalled, and our thoughts are with the families of those who have died as a result of this. And then she said, I am so deeply sorry. Do you hear that? She uses the word I, takes responsibility, expresses regret, takes responsibility. Will you try that with me? To say, I am sorry. Will you say it with me? I am sorry. It also makes restitution. 
And I thought, um, as I was thinking about making restitution, of words that come from 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance, and you fell to godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but a worldly grief produces death makes restitution. I couldn't help but thinking about making restitution, but thinking about the story about Zacchaeus. Remember the story about Zacchaeus? He was a tax collector who heard that Jesus was in town, and so he wanted to see Jesus as he was passing by. I wonder what it is in Zacchaeus' life that made him want to see Jesus so desperately. Do you think maybe there was something wrong in Zacchaeus' life that maybe was the reason She wanted to go to Jesus, and he wanted to go to Jesus and maybe find some mercy. What we know is that in those days, it was typical for tax collectors to add a lot on for themselves. And so maybe that's what was driving Zacchaeus to want to to see Jesus. But the part of the story that I think is an example of restitution is where um, after he had had dinner with Jesus, Remember what Zacchaeus says? He says, I'll sell half of everything that I have and give the proceeds to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay them back four times as much. That's what it means to make restitution. Here's another more modern example. Um, This video went viral about a week ago. The um, Washington Nationals were playing the Oakland Athletics, September 2nd, so that would have been, what, last Friday? Joey Menzies took a ball and threw it out to, there was a group of teenage girls, or maybe even younger than teenage, of girls in the stands, and he threw one of the balls to this group of girls in the stands. Whoever is filming this saw the ball going, and you, there's one girl in particular that you were just sure was going to get this ball, and then out of nowhere there comes this older adult hand into the frame, grabs the ball, and pulls it away from the little girl. Yeah, it's just not right. That was the caption that went on this video that was going viral. Old man steals ball from young girl. Do you know what the Washington Nationals did in response? because they were asked about it in a press conference afterwards. They got a ball and had Joey Menzies personally sign the ball and then sent it to her as kind of their way of apologizing that that had ever happened. True apology, says the words, I am sorry, expresses regret, takes responsibility, I am sorry, makes restitution, what can I do to make it right? The fourth point Gary Chapman and Jennifer Thomas point out is changes behavior, changes behavior. Remember the story of Jonah? Jonah, you know, was told to go to Nineveh. Instead, he went the exact opposite way to Tarshish. God had to turn him around, an act of repentance. And you remember why he was going to Nineveh? Because people were so bad in Nineveh that God wanted him to tell them it's time to change their ways. And so he went to Nineveh and he said, repent, it's time to change your ways. And you know what happened? They did. They changed their ways. Who would have thought? The word of God has that kind of power. I had the chance to see that on a much smaller scale not too long ago. Many of you know that since COVID, I've enjoyed doing more cycling than before that. I was down on the bicycle trail, and one of the things that I do when I'm back, especially from a long ride, is I treat myself to a Hawaiian ice. All right, I'll confess to you, sometimes I just go down there for the Hawaiian ice. So I was eating my Hawaiian ice over in Nesbitt Park, watching people. And one of the people that I watched was there was this older lady that was walking along the bike path. And coming in the other direction, there was this group of kids on skateboards. And you just kind of had a sense that this is not going to end well. And sure enough, one of them, as they were going past, kind of lost his balance and went into the lady who was walking along the bike path. Knocked her, not completely over, but certainly off balance. And she said, hey, kid, watch where you're going. That's not the cool part. 
The cool part is this group of kids then went over to the uh, picnic table that was right next to where I was sitting. She turned around and went back to them and said, young man, I just need to apologize. She said what I should have said was, you really startled me and I was afraid I was going to get hurt. I reacted more out of fear and so I just wanted to say I'm sorry. As she left, I heard one of the kids at the picnic table say to the rest of the group, how cool is that? How cool is that? Genuine repentance expresses regret, says I'm sorry, takes responsibility, uses the word I, I am sorry, makes restitution, asks how can I change things? Changes behavior. How can I do this differently or I'll never do it again? And the last thing that they suggest in this five languages of apology is ask for forgiveness. It's true that actions speak louder than words, but that doesn't mean that words aren't important. Ask for forgiveness. Say the words, please forgive me. They are, after all, a part of the example that Jesus gives us when he teaches to pray the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or, in other words, please forgive me. Some of you, if you're into old movies, may have seen an old movie that came out, um, I think this goes way back, maybe to the 1970s. Um, 1970, um, Ryan O'Neill and Ally McGraw starred in a movie called, do you know the movie, Love Story? And in it, there is a line that you probably have heard and maybe even repeated that says, love means never having to say, I'm sorry. With all due respect to Ryan and Allie, I'd like to suggest that that's not really true, that we all make mistakes from time to time, and so love, true love, real love, isn't afraid to say, I'm sorry. It's not afraid to say, I am sorry. It's not afraid to say, I was wrong. It's not afraid to say, what can I do to make it right, or I'll ch try not to do that again. It's not afraid to ask, to ask the question, will you please forgive me? Let the shepherd gather you in, let the widow, widow find you, and let the angels have reason to rejoice. Will you join with me in a time of prayer? Let us pray. We pray that you will come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts with more of you. We do remember that today is the anniversary, the 21st anniversary of 9-11, and so we remember those who lost their lives in the Pentagon and in the towers where, when they fell. We remember all of those who rose to the occasion to pick up the pieces after it was all over, and we confess that we're still trying to figure it all out. We thank you for the healing that we have already found, but we also pray that um, you will continue to work your healing touch in our lives. Speaking of healing and grief, we also um, remember all of those who are grieving the loss of Queen Elizabeth II. We know that she was a great leader in this country and meant a lot to a lot of people. And so we pray that you'll help those who are grieving, especially our brothers and sisters in, in the UK, her loss. Help them to find a sense of peace and of hope. Are there things in your life that you have done that you're not so proud of? Are there growing edges in your life where you're, you're still, we confess that we all have growing edges in our lives that we are still working on? There are times and places where we should have spoken up and we should have acted, but we failed to. And so, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. And so we pray that you will forgive us. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord and help us to hear you saying to us that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves your love for us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We offer these prayers in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught the disciples once and who teaches us still to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand and join together in singing our closing hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. wanted to make sure that you have on your calendar one is we mentioned at the beginning of the service that the concert that we've been talking about for weeks now is on Saturday this Saturday so remember that the, it's going to be great music um, you'll want to be here on Saturday I unfortunately have to apologize for Don and I being absent um, we have yeah, previously scheduled engagement in Ireland and so we will be traveling this week which may have you wondering all right so who's going to do the message next week Phil Winger has agreed and is working hard. He's going to ask, what can we learn from a child? So you'll want to be here next week. And remember to have um, October 2nd on your, we're going to have a state of the church conversation. We'll have worship at 9 o'clock, and then we're going to have the conversation at 1030. St. Francis of Assisi, in his great prayer, prayed, for it is in giving that we receive. And so I'd like to give you the opportunity to be generous. There is an offering box just to the left of the door as you leave. It's a white box about yay big. Or there's a tab on our website, lovelandumc.org, where you can give electronically. Let me leave you with these words from Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Stay safe and be well. Go in peace to serve the Lord and the people of God all said. Amen. Yeah. 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 Yeah.